finally, I believe this is my last slide on um, the MNT. This has the acceptable intake for non-nutritive sweeteners or the artificial sweeteners. Um, note that stevia is now safe during pregnancy. Um, the Rev-A, including any of the stevia glycoside sweeteners, you can re recommend that as well. I find a lot of women get um, concerned about using artificial sweeteners during pregnancy, and some of them feel more comfortable with stevia. If there's a way to help them uh, reduce the amount of sugar they're eating, I'm happy. So I'm glad we have that additional option to give them. I just want to point out that you don't want to have women using the herb stevia, like the, the actual green leaves or green powder. Most people don't use that because it's not widely available and it tastes very, very bitter. So any stevia sweetened product you'll find in the grocery store would be safe. It would be with one of the um, stevia glycosides, such as the Rev-A, that's sweet without the bitter compound. So that one is fine during pregnancy. It's just the herb stevia. We don't have enough evidence to say that it's safe. Okay, so if you have questions on any of the nutrition portion, please leave a uh, comment in the comment box, and we'll get to questions at the end of the presentation. In terms of exercise, um, ACOG recommends that pregnant women get 30 minutes or more of exercise pretty much every day of the week. Um, so we try to do the same. At minimum, I might say 20 minutes. If they can fit in a couple times a day, that's fine. If there's a time of day when their blood sugar is higher than normal uh, or higher than we expect, then that might be a really good time for them to exercise. And you got to be a little careful when they are um, using the oral hypoglycemics or insulin. Um, Again, pregnancy is a very unique time for positive behavior change. I feel so fortunate to work with pregnant women because in terms of diabetes care, they are the most motivated uh, patients you'll ever have. And they should combine some aerobic and strength training um, in their pregnancy. A lot of women that I see are not active at all. So if I can just get them walking, I'm happy. <laughs> if we can incorporate some strength exercises, that's really good too, and that's um, optimal. Key role as a health provider is you want to explain the benefits to mother and child. Um, you want to explain how it impacts the blood sugar. That's really important. You want to emphasize consistency so they don't do some crazy like three-hour hike one day and then nothing the rest of the week and wonder why their blood sugars are all, all over the place. Set expectations for the for the patient and try to you know talk to them and find a way to incorporate it into their existing schedule. Encourage uh, record keeping. I usually have them make a note of it on their food records, and they can start making connections between, oh, the days that I exercise, my blood sugar is a little better, and so on, and uh, reassess goals. I ask at every visit what exercise they're doing, what time of day, and how it coincides uh, with their meals, because it, it, it does change visit to visit. The glycemic benefits of exercise are Improving glucose control, especially fasting blood sugar, may take a little bit of time for you to see the impact, but it does help. Um, it increases insulin sensitivity, it increases glucose utilization, and it improves carbohydrate utilization. So your muscles are actually taking um, more glucose uh, during exercise. And even that effect lasts after the exercise as well. Um, maternal benefits are it's easier to just deal with all the changes in your body while you're pregnant like getting a bigger belly, like the lordosis, which is the uh, arching in the low back, and that change in the center of gravity. Um, also, it strengthens the pelvic floor, so uh, it can make labor a little bit easier, um, and it can make it easier for them to bounce back uh, after pregnancy and prevent that whole prolapse issue, which some women get. Fetal benefits of exercise are helping to prevent, um, if the women prevents excess weight gain in the pregnancy. It can actually reduce the uh, baby's risk of childhood overweight, type 2 diabetes, and even uh, metabolic syndrome. And I just love the picture at the bottom. Um, I'm going to pause here. We have another question for you. Next question. Do you feel comfortable counseling patients on exercise during pregnancy? Yes, no, not applicable. 93% um, said yes. Wonderful. 6% oh, said good. no, and 2% uh, said not applicable. Okay, great. That was more than I expected. I've given some lectures on 
um, exercise during pregnancy, and there's a lot of um, controversy and confusion. So I'm going to give you some safe aerobic exercises uh, for the women, and these come directly from ACOG, uh, walking, swimming, stationary bike, elliptical, step aerobics. Um, elliptical would be if they have access to a gym. I work with mainly low-income women, so often it's just walking that they have available. Um, I get some questions from the, the rare women with gestational diabetes who is into fitness about um, the heart rate. And actually, there's no uh, recommendation on heart rate during pregnancy or levels you should reach during exercise, just because it has a lot to do with your um, uh, fitness levels before conception. So the best way is to use the talk test. Make sure you can uh, maintain a light conversation with the person next to you. You don't want to get to the point where you are gasping for air. It's good to have your heart rate go up a little bit. It's good to feel like you're breathing a little heavier. Um, you just don't want to be uh, depriving yourself of oxygen. Uh, for safe strength exercise, they can use light weights, resistance bands, prenatal Pilates, prenatal yoga. They do want to be aware that um, as they get further along in the pregnancy and there's that release of the relaxin hormone that relaxes the joints and ligaments, there is a bigger risk of overstretching. So I just want to always give them uh, that caution. And of course, if you practice with good form, you prevent injury. So um, I'm also a Pilates teacher in addition to being a dietitian, so I'm very uh, particular on form. I realize most of the ladies I see don't have the luxury of seeing somebody personally for exercise classes. Um, but I do want to go over the, the benefits of uh, engaging their abdominal muscles, like thinking of pulling the baby in close to their spine, because that really does help prevent uh, low back injuries. Contraindicated exercise is anything that's uh, too jerky, like a very rapid twisting motion or bouncing, or anything that can uh, result in abdominal trauma. I think all of these go without saying. I do have some women who've been involved in like kickboxing class, so I want to discourage that and have them maybe do a step aerobics class instead, or a prenatal Pilates class, or just simply go for a walk. ACOG has a, some great resources for exercise um, and a couple uh, downloadable files. Some of them are more geared towards the provider. In my opinion, even the one for the patient is a little, um, a little about the reading level, the patients that I see, but at least it's helpful if you want to develop your own uh, exercise educational materials. I definitely look at their website. So in summary, 30 minutes or more of exercise uh, per day, unless there's complications, and aerobic and strength exercise would be ideal. And there's many, many benefits for the mom other than just glycemic control. If you have questions about exercise, please put them in the comment box. And I'll go on to the main event, the holiday eating. So as an overview, a lot of women have challenges with their family or their schedule balancing their medicine and insulin um, with their family and their schedule, uh, comfort foods. Um, I'll talk about the plate method and how that can be helpful in holiday meal planning, some mindful eating tips, and just some tips for working with your patients. So, okay, we're going to have a question after this slide, but I just want you to think back um, how many of you hear from your patients that their family is telling them to eat more. You're eating for two, you're not eating enough, you're starving yourself. I hear that all the time. So Cynthia, why don't you go ahead with the question. Okay, so do your patients report similar comments from family and friends who are trying to be supportive? So 82% said yes, this is what they're hearing from their patients. 14% said no, wow. And 5% uh, said it's not applicable. Okay. I hear these all the time. Um, it's actually rare that I have a woman come in who doesn't tell me that she's been hearing this. Oftentimes they're uh, concerned that maybe they're not gaining enough weight. Usually they're fine. Oftentimes they're gaining too much weight for their gestational age. Um, so you really want to discuss with them what their family is uh, telling them to do 
and make sure they know how to handle those comments. If they're actually feeling full and they don't want any extra food, it's okay to tell your family that I've had enough, I'd love to take this home for another meal, or if I have too much of this, my blood sugar will go high and my doctor is nervous for the health of the baby if my blood sugar is too high. However, they need to find a way to explain to their family so they don't feel so pressured. It's also difficult when you have guests from out of town. Sometimes patients haven't told their family. They think they won't understand or um, maybe they're embarrassed or feel shame. They might fear disappointing their family members if they eat less of their food. You know, you want to eat Aunt Penny's mashed potatoes and if you don't, she thinks there's a problem with them or something. Um, maybe they feel left out. You can't indulge the way you usually do at these big family meals. Maybe everyone's paying attention to you, maybe they're trying to restrict your food for you. It can go in both directions. The schedule is a big challenge. Uh, for women who maybe have a break from work, that'll really change the time that they're waking up and checking their fasting blood sugar or um, eating their meals or taking their medicines. Um, their sleep schedule might change probably not going to exercise as much when there's family in town. And it can just be difficult to plan meals and snacks and um, not overeat unless you plan ahead. Medicine or insulin, if they are traveling, they want to have it in their carry-on luggage. They don't want to have it get uh, separated. Of course, now that how we fly, um, you have to have your uh, liquids out in the little plastic baggie. So hopefully if they're... Um, Traveling, be sure they have a small carry-on bag so they can bring that with them and take that out when they get to security. Have snacks with them. Have their medications um, within reach if they need them. Have everything labeled with pharmaceutical labels so there's no question about it at airport security or the border or something. And store things at the appropriate temperature. So I get a little concerned if they're going to a sort of tropical area and they're taking their insulin with them because it could get too warm. Uh, comfort foods, a lot of them are very high in carbohydrates like tamales or mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes. Um, the drinks, big challenge, the atole, the apple cider, uh, eggnog. So you want to discuss some of the foods that they expect to eat during the holidays and maybe some portion sizes um, and help them plan their meals. So if they are going to have tamales, what are they going to have with it? I mean, if they have uh, it depends on the size of the tamale because you can make them with a lot of masa or a little bit of masa. But if they're going to have, you know, two tamales, that might already be 60 grams of carbohydrate. And there might not be room for rice and beans and tortillas at the meal. So how are they going to plan ahead? Um, I love using the plate method. Uh, this is one version. You can also use the MyPlate for gestational diabetes. Um, really encouraging that almost half their plate is vegetables at the meal. Um, automatically that limits the amount of space <laughs> available for the carbohydrate foods. Um, we also know that people who eat off of a smaller plate often serve themselves less food, up to 30% less food, just from using a salad plate instead of a big dinner plate. I want them to actually think of what their food's going to look like on their plate. Um, most of the time, the foods are a lot of the uh, holiday foods are very high in carbs, so if you did the plate on the left there, we would probably expect to have a high blood sugar at the end of the meal as opposed to the one on the right, which has some vegetables in there and the protein balanced out and just a quarter of the plate coming from carbohydrates.